Speaking of 1917, did you see Ryan Johnson's tweets uh, from like last week? No. He said, last night at the PGA Awards, Mendez told me that 1917 was actually shot in one continuous take. If an actor flubbed a line, they'd go all the way back and start again from the beginning. They paid Cumberbatch to show up every day and wait in that room at the end. He was there six months. <laughs> <laughs> they paid him $23 million. <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. They had a production walkie stashed in the bunker. He'd wait in character. Wait, a few times a day, the walkie would squawk, going again. <laughs> uh, that's that's amazing. That's, that, that's great. No, I haven't seen yeah, it's pretty great. I love Ryan Johnson. He went to a Billy Joel concert last week, and I kind of lost my mind because Ryan Johnson and Billy Joel are two of my current favorite people. Uh. So anyways, <laughs> welcome everybody to episode 82 of Cinescope. I have here with me Dan Lefeb. I learned how to pronounce your name last time, thankfully. So <laughs> I'm glad to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be back. How about you remind everybody who you are, what you do, uh, why they might know you, uh, all that kind of stuff before we get started? Uh, well, yeah, Dan LeFemme, I'm the host of Based on a True Story, so uh, another podcast that compares movies with history. So 1917, great example. I had a chat with the senior curator at the National World War I Museum and Memorial about the historical accuracy of that movie. That's super cool. And you've been on Cinescope before, and we talked previously about a movie that was also based on a true story. Uh, we talked about Argo yes. together. And if I cursed, and if this was a cursing show, I would have said the quote, but I did not. <laughs> and I am not. So unfortunately, here we are. Yeah. <laughs> you can go look that one up, up online. <laughs> yes. And go see the movie and go listen to the episode and go check out Dan's podcast. Thank it's really great. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and just transition into our movie discussion. And I'm really excited to talk about this one. I've got a list of movies that, sure, I would love to talk about these someday. And a lot of times, uh, if the guest that I am inviting onto Cinescope doesn't have a particular movie in mind that they would like to talk about, then I say, oh, well, here's this list I have. Would you like to talk about any of these? And so you were one of those guests this time, and you saw Adventures of Tintin, and you said, hey, let's talk about Adventures of Tintin. And I said, yes, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So I'm, I'm excited because this is a Spielberg film. This is a Peter Jackson produced film. It is scored by John Williams, and it is currently his only feature length animated film score. Mm -hmm. Now, just as a sort of intro and maybe dating the podcast a little bit, his only other animated credit is Kobe Bryant's short film, Dear Basketball. So hmm. uh, rest in peace to him, not to bring the podcast down, but it's topical, wanted to mention it. And now let's go ahead and move on to the stats for The Adventures of Tintin. It released December 21st of 2011, was directed by Steven Spielberg. I don't need to list Spielberg's filmography, <laughs> but just so you have a few movies to sort of think back to, there's Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and the other Indiana Jones films, Schindler's List, Jurassic Park, Saving Private Ryan, Catch Me If You Can, Lincoln, War Horse, The BFG, The Post, Ready Player One, and the upcoming West Side Story remake, which I'm really excited for because I really like Spielberg and I really like West Side Story. Now, this, this movie is written by, and this really interested me because I didn't know this before now, it was written by Stephen Moffat, Edgar Wright, and Joe Cornish. Now, Joe Cornish is not a name that I'm overly familiar with, though I, I do know it. I think he is a director as well. In fact, I'm going to look that up just sort of while I'm talking right now. Uh, he directed The Kid Who Would Be King. Okay. I'm not familiar with him, but I wasn't aware until until we were getting ready to record also that uh, Stephen Moffat was involved in this. Yeah, and Stephen Moffat first came to the scene, really, in Doctor Who, the Doctor Who reboot. And then he did Sherlock with Benedict Cumberbatch and Martin Freeman. And so I, I'm looking at his filmography right now. Yes, he wrote... Adventures of Tintin. Joe Cornish uh, wrote Adventures of Tintin. He also wrote Attack the Block and directed it. And uh, he's listed as a writer for the first Ant-Man film and the the film that I mentioned a moment ago, The Kid Who Would Be King that came out last year. It's supposed to be really, really good. I uh, haven't seen it yet, but that that is Joe Cornish as well. And then Edgar Wright is the other name attached to this. And he wrote and directed Baby Driver and uh, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World and lots of movies in that vein. So really a lot of talent 
attached to this film it, just on the the directing and writing and producing side because uh, you've got Peter Jackson from Lord of the Rings there as well. For sure. And on the acting side too. Yeah. We already mentioned that the music was composed by John Williams and I'm not going to list all of his stuff. <laughs> just look at Spielberg's filmography, look at Star Wars, the first three Harry Potter films, etc. The movie stars Jamie Bell, Andy Serkis, Daniel Craig, Nick Frost, Simon Pegg, Toby Jones, Daniel Mays, Mackenzie Crook, Gad Elmala, and N. Reitel. So at least those first like five or six names, really, really huge people. So what was your first experience with this movie? Do you remember? Nine years ago? Yeah. Nearly? Actually, this I saw this one in theaters when it came out. Because when it came out, the company that I worked for did training for VFX companies. And so mm-hmm. we always like to go see animated movies in theaters together. And at the time, What a Digital, who was the primary on, on the effects and the animation, they were one of our clients. And so everyone in the office, I remember, was especially excited to go see their work on Tintin. And when I saw it, I wasn't really familiar with the comics or the TV series. I didn't even know that they were, there were other people in the office that were more into the comics and and knew that, but I went into it pretty much with fresh eyes and I loved it. It was, I mean, it's in the title. It was a, it was an adventure and it was a great adventure. It was, you know, I I think that my first experience with this movie, I don't believe I saw it in theaters. I would have bought it on Blu-ray and I think this was the year where I first started really getting into the Oscars and trying to get all the movies all, I could get my hands on, see everything. So I, I would have a fight in the who can get the most guesses right for the the awards night. And so I'd pick this up and I knew it was Spielberg. I knew it was John Williams. And I mean, that, that's how they advertise this movie, basically. It was like it was a Spielberg's and Peter Jackson movie. And I didn't have experience with the comic either. Still haven't even picked it up or read into it outside of just the pictures that I've seen of it. So, yeah, the main appeals for me were Spielberg, Peter Jackson, John Williams. And I liked it a lot from the beginning as well. I think the the sort of cliched but accurate <laughs> comparison is to Indiana Jones, sort of like an animated version appealing to a younger audience. It's fun. It's colorful. It's exciting. The animation is fantastic. It is motion capture film. Uh, and so I was actually reading, there was test footage that was originally made before they started official production where Robert Zemeckis, who did motion capture films such as Beowulf and the Polar Express and the Christmas Carol with Jim Carrey, and also James Cameron, who of course did Avatar with all that performance capture stuff. They were present for the filming of that that footage to sort of help things along. Uh, so again, lots of people involved in this. I do have to say... I wish that the American release had the full title that other places in the world got, which is not simply The Adventures of Tintin, it's The Adventures of Tintin, Secret of the Unicorn. And that doesn't say much else, but it does sort of evoke a sense of mystery, you know, to the film that the the plain title Adventures of Tintin doesn't necessarily give. Yeah. And as I recall, and again, I'm not as familiar with the comics. I haven't picked up any since then, but as I recall it, there are quite a few different stories. And I was reading up on this too. I think uh, Spielberg picked the unicorn, the secret of the unicorn out of a a handful of different options uh, to turn it into a feature film. Essentially, he thought that that one lended itself best to being a feature film. Mm -hmm. I'm reading right now that this actually draws from three different volumes of the Tintin series. There's The Crab with the Golden Claws, The Secret of the Unicorn, and then Red Rackham's Treasure. So it it is sort of a compilation of different ideas from the comics. But yeah, I'm I'm curious to seek out the comics, this watch through especially after it's been it's been several years since I last watched this movie. But this watch through especially made me want to seek out the comics and explore the world a little bit more. Yeah, I would definitely be up for reading the comics, of course, it might be saying something that the movie came out uh, almost a decade ago now, and I still haven't, but uh, hopefully (laughs) this will remind me to go actually do that. (laughs) Well, what about the story or the animation or anything like that do you have to say about this film? The first time I saw it, I remember just being amazed at the breadth of the different perils that they encounter. You know, it goes all the way from almost a a picture-perfect European town that Tintin lives in and then he's sneaking into this museum at night and there's they're dealing with pickpockets and being captured and a cargo ship and a seaplane and and there's massive storm and desert and it just goes into so many different 
sets and so many different environments that um, I think that, that the way that the story interwove all of those different environments and had it make sense, I think that's really what drew me to it as a well-made adventure story because it's it's not just, oh, we're over here now or over over here now, but it's or everything not happening in a single place. You feel like this entire world actually exists and it feels very real, you know, even though it's, it is animated. I don't know. It just, it really stuck out to me that there's just so much that gets packed into the movie. I love the animation style for this. I, I read actually that they were aiming for photorealistic animation as if the textures of the skin, the clothes, the environment were all real, but the only exception of that being that it was still set in the world of the original comic that's that same art style Mm -hmm. so it looks like real that the comic creator's name is herge i think herg Uh, i I don't know exactly how to pronounce it but herge Uh, so it's within his world of comics as if it was a real place so i really like that idea and that approach and the fact that it's animation lends itself to a whole lot of different possibilities. There's the scene in the desert where Haddock is describing the unicorn. And then right in the middle of the story, you see it coming from the distance. Mm-hmm. And as it approaches the dune and approaches the crest of it, as it comes down, all of a sudden, everything is transformed into ocean and waves and uh, salt spray. And it is so cool the way they're able to do that transition into the, the memory that he's experiencing or the hallucination, if you want to call it that. There's also other moments uh, like where we zoom out from the lifeboat that Tintin and Haddock have escaped on from the Caribou Jean. And as we zoom out, we see that the boat is now in a street puddle that Mr. Silk steps in back in uh, the original city. And then later, another instance, Tintin and Haddock shake hands. And as we zoom in on their hands, we see all of a sudden there they are again riding camels or horses into the desert on the hands that turned into mountains and hills and all that kind of stuff. And so there's really cool animated transition stuff that, I mean, frankly, Indiana Jones couldn't do because Indiana Jones is live action. It just, it's not possible. And to that end, there's one more thing that I wanted to mention in that vein. The entire chase scene in Begar is like a single take. I mean, speaking of 1917 (laughs) being a single take, this is... It's basically like that, but the way it's done, uh, where you're following them through the city, across buildings, all the way through this place, it, it'd be very difficult to capture like that in live action. And it's such a fantastic car chase scene in Bagar. And man, that, the animation allows for so many possibilities. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't really think about that particular scene, but I thought of basically the same same idea of when the unicorn is fighting the pirate ship. I don't know if we ever get the name of the actual pirate ship, but uh, Red Rackham's pirate ship. And Mm -hmm. there's so much that happens that is just beyond reality. Now, the first thing I would compare it to is, you know, the pirates of the Caribbean movies, right? With those came out in the early two thousands, I think. So those were already out. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of people kind of tend to use those as an example of boilerplate Hollywood version of a pirate battle on the high seas. And Mm -hmm. you get some of that with the way that it starts, but then it gets into this very, like something that you can't actually do where the ships are tied together and one of them being pulled completely sideways where, you know, Captain Haddock runs along the mast because it's completely horizontal to cut the pirate ship free so that they Mm -hmm. separate. Things like that, that I love that they have it be very realistic, but also push the boundaries of that realistic aspect because it is animated and so you can do that easier going back just well to the beginning of the movie there's one specific thing that i always like to call attention to when it happens in movies that we discuss on the show give me all the opening credits i love opening credits that are just like they feature simple visuals or they feature the music in a big way and that's exactly what we get here the opening credits of this film is just a great way for the film to initially just sort of pay tribute to the original medium of the comics it was based on. It's it's very much in that style, uh, two-dimensional, and it's sort of 
a great way to give us a little bit of a precursor to the type of film we're about to get. We see Tintin and Snowy go on this whole adventure in the opening credits where they're trying to recover this special orb from bad guys. And there's violence. I mean, it, it's it's really, really great. It gives us a, sort of a, a precursor to what we're about to see. And I mean, we're going to talk about it more later, but John Williams' score for this movie is so great. And so that that's my appeal Everybody out there, filmmakers listening to this podcast, I'm sure you are, give us opening credits all the time, please. <laughs> yeah, it reminded me of like the old Pink Panther movies. Remember those? Where you have this whole adventure going on in the cartoon in the opening credits uh, before the movie even begins. <laughs> or like Monsters, Inc. is one that just yes. popped into mind yes. where you got that, that animated sequence that's building the title card. Mm-hmm. Or you have West Side Story to bring that up again. The whole beginning of that original film is lines dropping down from the top of the screen to form the skyline of New York City and the whole time we're listening to Leonard Bernstein's score. So I love it. Please showcase the music. Give that a moment to shine on its own. Give us something else to look at while it's happening and then transition us into the film. So great. Since uh, before we move on from the beginning, since you mentioned the beginning, at the very beginning of the movie, when we first see Tintin, he's having a portrait painted of him. And that uh-huh. is the original Tintin artwork from the comics, if I'm not mistaken, right. of that, which I thought was a great way to honor that medium, you know, the, the comic that he came out of. Mm-hmm. And the the person who draws that sort of caricature is this, is supposed to be somebody who bears a resemblance of the original comic artist, too. Hmm. <laughs> um, Herge. Again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's spelled H E R G. E and the E, the second E has a little accent work over it. <laughs> yeah, I saw that and I'm not sure either. <laughs> now, one more thing I wanted to say about the story stuff is that I like that it's like a kid's Indiana Jones that doesn't try to overly be for kids. Yes, there's some slapstick moments. Yes, there is goofy humor, but there's gunfights, there are deaths, and there's violence. It gets pretty dark in certain aspects for a kid's film. There's There's blood for crying out loud. Yeah. That said, there's some fun visual gags that are clearly aimed at kids, but they they still really made me laugh or made me chuckle. There's when Mr. Silk runs into the lady as Thompson and Thompson approach him, (laughs) and we see yellow canaries flying around his head. (laughs) But then we see a man is chasing the canaries with a a net because we're right outside of his pet shop or his bird shop or whatever. (laughs) And then... When Tintin is swimming in the ocean, trying to get to the guys who are flying the plane, trying to kill him, his hair is above the water like a shark fin as he draws an ear. It's it's silly little things. And yes, that's referencing a Spielberg film inside of a Spielberg (laughs) film, but who cares? It's so much fun. And I said there was one more thing that I wanted to talk about in the story section. There's actually one more thing that I wanted to talk about, and that's that we have some of the coolest action scenes, even among live action films in this movie. The fights aboard the unicorn and Rackham ship, almost like the one we see, you mentioned this earlier, in Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. And then the one as they race the gunpowder trail in that that second memory Mm -hmm. where Haddock, Sir Francis Haddock, is trying to blow up the ship to protect the treasure from Rackham. And he set that gunpowder on fire and him and Rackham start sword fighting and one snuffs it out and the other one lights it again. And one snuffs it out and the other one, it's, it's such a cool action scene. And it's another one that it's almost like a single take where the camera's just following them as they progress throughout the ship and down the stairs and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's so great. Yeah. There were a lot of really great. Oh, I mean, yeah, just overall action scenes. You mentioned how it's, there were a lot of scenes that were, for kids, but also not really targeted that way. And one thing is you were talking about that, that really came to mind, just the overall idea of Captain Haddock essentially being an alcoholic. I mean, just that, oh, that yeah. being such a prominent part of the whole storyline, it's definitely not for kids, but the way that they, they pulled it off and the way that they, like when they're in the, in the desert and he doesn't have anything to drink because they're, you know, they've been walking in the desert and Tintin's like, oh, you know, all it took was a day in the Sahara for you to sober up, right? This is what sober feels right. like. <laughs> and they they make jokes about that. Um, They're still able to make light of that situation, which I think is walking a, a very fine line, but they did a great job. Moving on to character talk, what do you have to say about Tintin? I think my, my favorite character overall there is going to be Snowy. I love how he's still a dog but he's you can tell he's so smart like how he helps Tintin 
find the scroll in the apartment. Speaking of alcohol, replacing the water with alcohol to help Haddock remember more of his story, things like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Little things like that are helping him find the, the hidden part of the cellar at uh, Marlin Spike Hall near the end. Even though they, they kept him as a dog, he couldn't actually talk. He still was a very integral part of the entire story. And I thought they did a great job of, again, walking that line. You've got to love good animal companions in films, especially animated ones, obviously. And he is no exception. He's curious. He's exploratory. He's nosy. And yes, he's very cute, too. (laughs) And, you know, we see elements of bravery from him. He's not afraid to stand his ground, even as a dog, uh, like he does with the guard dog at Marlin Spike. Mm -hmm. He, He stands in front of Tintin to protect him. And now the guard dog and Snowy are friends. And we see them even playing again at the end of the film when they return to Marlin Spike Hall. You see Snowy's resolve in chasing the car that took Tintin and kidnapped him onto the Caribujan. You see him run off and seek help in the desert to save Tintin and Haddock after they've passed out from exhaustion. So Snowy gets to play the hero many times, not to mention those moments that you already did mention. So that's that's really cool that the dog plays such an important part. But he, yeah, he's smart. Okay. I was about to say he's not outside the realm of believability. He is. <laughs> but he's still very much a dog. Yeah. and he. He's so cute and so important to the story. Like you said, you really sort of forgive that. And I mean, it's a kid's film, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't begrudge the dog that maybe is a little bit larger than life. Well, I mean, it fits within the world that they've created because a lot of right. a lot of the scenes, even some of just the way some of the shots are that you that we've talked about, the one one take shots where are unbelievable themselves. But mm-hmm. in that way, he fits perfectly into that that world. Now, as for Tintin himself, from the beginning, we learn a lot about him without them just having to tell us stuff. We get that he's been in the papers for one reason or another. He's well-read in world history uh, as he's first exploring the unicorn model that he sees in the market. In the newspaper clippings we see in his home, we see that he's some kind of journalist, some kind of mystery solver or explorer. Of course, we already got the sort of gist of him from the opening credits that I mentioned, but we, we also see how he's got a history. When the man comes, the American comes and is shot on his doorstep. He says, Mrs. Finch, a man has been shot on our doorstep. She says, oh, not again. <laughs> like, oh, this is just everyday occurrence. This has happened before. <laughs> She's like his Mrs. Hudson from Sherlock. I mean, oh, this is just every day. This is the usual, I guess. And I love how inquisitorial he is. He asks lots of questions about things, whether it's about the motives or the history or whatever else. He's always asking questions to try and figure out what the next step is for him, what the next piece of information he needs to seek needs to be, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and he's not satisfied until he finds those answers. Like, very, very beginning, he could have very easily, I mean, it would have been a really short movie, but, you know, right away, as soon as he buys that ship, like a few seconds later, the, the model ship of the unicorn, a few seconds later, somebody offers him a bunch of money. And mm-hmm. we can only assume, you know, if he's a, a journalist... He's young. I guess it's an assumption to assume that he definitely could use that money. And so Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's telling of his character that he realized right away that there has to be something to this, that all of a sudden people are interested in this model that I just bought a few seconds ago, and they're willing to pay me an exorbitant amount more than I just paid for it. (laughs) There is stuff that we don't know about him and we don't find out, but I, I like that he's just sort of this established character. So we don't really need to know this information right now. Stuff like how old he is specifically, Uh, according to a quick Google search, he's in the vicinity of 15 to 18 years old. Uh, We don't know where his parents are. We don't know why he lives alone or anything like that. Maybe it's just a cultural thing because he's in Brussels, I believe, at the beginning of the film. That's where he lives is Brussels. So I don't know. Maybe it's just like a he's of age kind of situation, at least for the culture. But there's plenty of questions that the film doesn't seek to answer because it's not necessarily important that they are answered, but it leaves us pondering them. So maybe it draws us into the character more. It leaves us possibilities for things we might find out in future films, hopefully, fingers crossed, all that kind of stuff. So I I like Tintin. And when we get to Haddock, he provides sort of the support that Haddock needs to break his alcohol addiction. He's the one who encourages him. He's the one who sort of shames him a couple of times to say, hey, listen, this is not the way to go. This is not the thing to do. Alcohol has made you a certain way, and that does not make you a better person. It makes you actually a worse person. And it, he he gently guilts Haddock into going sober. Yeah, but they, throughout it all, 
they become really good friends, I think. And I think right. even though in in the beginning, you can tell Haddock is kind of hesitant. He's kind of not really into the friendship as much. He's more selfish, I guess, would be a, a way to phrase that. Uh, more mm-hmm. what's in it for me. It's kind of the implication that I got from him. But you can tell uh, he probably, in my mind, has one of the biggest character arcs through the entire movie because of this whole adventure that they go on. Absolutely. You say he's got the biggest arc. He's definitely the one I have the most notes on. (laughs) What I find really compelling about his character, at least from the start, is he's drowning himself in alcohol because he sees himself as unworthy of the legacy of his grandfather, Sir Francis. He only challenges himself to try to live up to that legacy thanks to the challenges given by Tintin. There's one point where Tintin asks him straight to his face, you call yourself a haddock? Like, seriously? Like, this is the person you came from, and this is the person you are. Do you really think that measures up? And it's because of the relationship they'd built up to that point in the film, the the, the trust that had built between them, that, that that's effective. If that trust hadn't been built, then him saying that would have just been an insult. But instead, it, it leads to him being disappointed in himself. So for, for Haddock to have already expressed shame in his alcoholism, it get, just gets greatened it it increases with Tintin to first show his praise when Haddock does well but then when he goes off the wagon again or when Tintin thinks he's gone off the wagon again and expresses his disappointment it hurts Haddock even more and really serves as a wake-up call for achieving real sobriety yeah <laughs> I, I just keep going back to that scene where he's looking at the the glass of water it's like what is this <laughs> <laughs> what will they think of next <laughs> what will they think of next? it's so great <laughs> i love the unfolding of the memories hmm. when they're first in the desert he's he's sobering up but he's he's sweating it out he's hallucinating a little bit and he has those flashes of remembrance the transformation of the desert scene that i mentioned earlier and he himself transforms into Sir Francis. And he says, Haddocks don't flee in his memory hallucinations. And that that sort of returns later when he does get the chance to stand up to Saccharin. And he says, a Haddock always has a trick up his sleeve. Uh, so I, I love those little moments where he remembers who he's supposed to be in the moments where he is sort of, quote, out of body or something like that. He has a remarkable memory when... Well, when he's drunk, I guess is the way to say it. But even when he's not, again, you kind of going back to the character arc at the very end, there's that one little tiny island that's not real on the globe uh, Mm -hmm. where, where the treasure is. And I thought it was an interesting little point there that at that point, we assume he's sobered again because he, to my knowledge, he hasn't really drank since that one scene after the desert. But he's still able to remember that from a time when, you know, he mentions, well, I've, I've sailed the seas many times, so of course I know where that is. But we can assume, or I'm assuming, I guess, while he was sailing that, that he was in his drinking ways. So he was probably drunk the whole time. But it's it was interesting to me that he could start to remember those things, uh, which he seemed to be having trouble doing uh, remembering what Sir Francis had had said to him, so I thought that was an interesting little little bit there that he seems to be remembering things from earlier time without needing to drink. That ending scene you're mentioning, I love how full circle it comes when Haddock realizes how exactly like his grandfather he actually is. He started the film off saying, "I drink because I could never live up to Sir Francis," but here he proves that. He is a haddock after all by finding that treasure via the mysterious island that doesn't exist. And when he opens it up and he pulls out his grandfather's hat filled with treasure, he pours out the treasure as if I don't care about this. And he dons the hat. And it's like he's basking in the glory of, yes, I actually am my grandfather's grandson. And I have finally found myself living up to his legacy. That's what I thought was really cool was how the the hat symbolized so much for him and that's what he focused on more than the actual money or the treasure that he found yeah i thought that was a great moment there in fact it's tintin who digs into the the globe further and finds oh this isn't even actually all of it let's let's go find it now (laughs) it's he sort of has to wake haddock from his stupor of standing in his grandfather's footsteps yes yes it leads perfectly into the sequel that hopefully they're going to do (laughs) Uh, hopefully uh, the last update i saw was from 2018 where spielberg said Jackson's going to be the one directing it. So 
Okay. We'll see what happens, but who knows? It's already been nearly nine years. Yeah. <laughs> One more thing about Haddock. We see Tintin offering him support as he expresses doubt in himself throughout the film. But towards the end of the film, when there's a moment when Tintin feels low, Haddock steps up and offers the support that he has already been given. He, he has this great quote that I'm going to go ahead and read all of. He says, there are plenty of others willing to call you a failure, a fool, a loser, a hopeless souse. Don't you ever say it of yourself. You send out the wrong signal. That is what people pick up. Don't you understand? You care about something, you fight for it. You hit a wall, you push through it. There's something you need to know about failure, Tintin. You can never let it defeat you. And the way he says that final line is him admitting to himself that for all these years, he'd let failure defeat him and he'd let himself drink away his problems. And it's just a fantastic moment of self-realization as he almost resolves in that moment, I can't let that happen to me again. As he's encouraging Tintin, he's encouraging himself and saying, failure cannot defeat you. It cannot defeat me. Let's push through and see this through. Hmm. That's a great quote. I didn't remember that one, but yeah. Do you have anything to say about Saccharin as a villain? I think, well, the biggest thing that I my takeaway from him, he seemed like a kind of a stereotypical villain, but there were two things that I thought were interesting that they had in his character. And again, I don't know if this is part of the comic version or just something that they had just in the movie, but first was that he's very much like Haddock where Saccharin is trying to live up to his family's legacy. It just so happens that his family's legacy is the uh, <laughs> feuding with the Haddocks. He knows why, but he he lets it really get to him there. And then the other part I thought was very interesting that they had was Saccharin's Falcon, which I thought was very much like Tintin and Snowy in their relationship where the, the Falcon was just doing whatever Saccharin wanted, uh, going to get the the model. And, you know, he, he again, was pretty smart because he knocked the ship down and pulled out the scroll without carrying the entire ship. So he knew what he was going for. You can tell there were some smarts there. But I thought it was interesting that even in the villain, there's uh, character traits and there's arcs there that mimic the hero's side as well. Those parallels are interesting where you have the the dual animal companions and then the way that Saccharin is, where, where Haddock is trying to live up to a legacy set by his grandfather, Saccharin is trying to almost redeem his grandfather or seek revenge for his grandfather or whatever the relationship is uh, between him and Red Rackham. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I thought was really compelling about Saccharin as a character is that he's seeking revenge of somebody who doesn't seem to have a lot, right? right? Haddock isn't a rich man. He's just a sailor. He's a captain. Sure. He's got a ship. Sure. But Saccharin has a whole lot of wealth. So what motivation does he really have for seeking more wealth? And it goes down to, I've got to seek revenge for my grandfather, for Red Rackham. I've got to finish what he started. And so I thought that was a really interesting thing to consider was that he doesn't need this thing that he's after. Whereas if Haddock had been sober and had known about the treasure and about the possibilities of him finding it, then he might have been going after it. But instead, he's just enjoying his life as a sailor. And this might get into my kind of relevance overall later on, but I, I see them as almost the same person. Uh, it's just their generations beforehand were on opposite sides. And now, for some reason, they feel that they have to be on opposite sides as well. Now, I don't have other characters necessarily to talk a whole lot about. I do have to say that Thompson and Thompson <laughs> are very fantastic characters. Those are played by Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, which, of course, are uh, they're sort of a duo in other films in general. So it's fun to have the two of them. And then the only thing I wanted to mention about Bianca Castafiore was <laughs> it was hysterical. I laughed really hard when she called Saccharin Monsieur Sugar Additif. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so fantastic. <laughs> so good. Yeah, those are great. And I would I would watch an entire movie with Thompson and Thompson. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> It'd be like the penguins of Madagascar, right? Just there. Uh, that would be great. <laughs> That, that would be great. They're so funny. You always wonder in with people like that behind the roles, how much of it is improvised. Of course, being an animated film, probably none of it is improvised. Everything's planned. But still, the personalities of those two actors shines through so well in these like bumbling, silly detective characters. <laughs> yeah. I, I love that they're a part of the film and that Tintin just accepts him as part of his life. He doesn't really like roll his eyes at them. It's just like, oh, this is Thompson and Thompson. This is how they are. They help me sometimes. But otherwise, they're just there. That scene in the the pickpockets' house was amazing. Right. <laughs> like, the the guy's like, "Oh, you got me. Oh, I can't help it. I just like it." <laughs> and they're just completely oblivious. <laughs> right. <So great. laughs> they, they help him into his house. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, look! Looks like somebody stole stole uh, yours too. <laughs> all these wallets. Uh, so great. Any other characters to mention? Uh, no, that was that was pretty much all the, the main ones that I had. Okay, do you have anything to say about the music? Yes, I mean, okay, so it's it's John Williams, so obviously it's going to be great. Mm-hmm. But when I was listening to this soundtrack, and I put it on, listened to a, a few times as I was working, it, from beginning to end, seemed like a best of from John Williams. Like, the main theme reminded me instantly of Catch Me If You Can, a mixture mm-hmm. of that and Indiana Jones. Some other tracks, The Pursuit of the Falcon, reminded me of some of the chase music from Indiana Jones. The song uh, Sir Francis and the Unicorn reminded me of Jurassic Park. Uh, You have Uh the presenting Bianca Castafiore, which when it first started, I I had to make sure that my playlist didn't skip to uh, something else because I was like, wait, this just (laughs) sounds like a straight up classical piece. Uh, And then, of course, you know, the, the opera style comes in. But it's it's just it's a great soundtrack that just mixes, in my mind, the best of John Williams into obviously new songs, but they just remind mm-hmm. me of all those songs. Uh, Escape from Venice, that's the the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade song that right. uh, reminds me. But yeah, just it's just a great great soundtrack. I would not be surprised even a little bit if Spielberg's sort of instruction to John Williams or their sort of mutual decision was to say let's just compose another Indiana Jones score. (laughs) Like, why not? (laughs) Because that's what this is. It's so much in that Indiana Jones vein. Yes, I also had notes of Catch Me If You Can written in my notes uh, because Catch Me If You Can is also a very jazzy style. And John Williams' original starts, his foundation is in jazz piano. So it's sort of back to his roots when you get this sort of jazzy stuff that we get in the main theme. And I mean this seriously. This is one of Williams' finest main titles. It is so good. I'm not going to sit here and like give a ranked list of it or anything. <laughs> and it's not likely to be sung by any random person on the street like Indiana Jones or Star Wars. But it's among my favorite of John Williams' main themes. It's so, so good. Something that Williams is most known for as a film composer, especially with stuff like Star Wars, is the concept of leitmotif. And that, that term means it's a recurring theme that represents a character, a place, a person, or a thing. And so we get several themes throughout this film that return again and again and again, depending on what's being talked about or what's being shown on the screen. So we get the theme we get for the unicorn. The first time we hear it is as Tintin is uh, unraveling the scroll. So the original time it's heard on the soundtrack is in this track, The Secret of the Scrolls. And we get lots of the unicorn theme throughout the film. Anytime the notes are discussed, those scrolls are discussed. Uh, But my favorite iteration of it is as they're walking through the desert and Haddock begins to hallucinate and remember the story of his grandfather, you can hear that the unicorn theme starts playing on this low flute Hmm. as he begins to describe the ship. And then as we get further into the memory and it starts picking up the action, it transforms into this, it, it goes from the mysterious theme, like the map room from the original Raiders of the Lost Ark into a more swashbuckling adventure theme as the ships and the crews do battle. It's so cool how that, that theme is used throughout the film. There was something that I noticed or I read in an article as I was prepping for this. I didn't realize this, but you had mentioned uh, this was the first uh, score that John Williams did for an animated movie. But Mm -hmm. he actually wrote all of the music before the movie was animated because they used to do that. The Disney animators used to do that. They used to have the music first and then they would animate to the music instead of the other way around. And so that's what John Williams did with with this movie Mm -hmm. was he wrote the music and then the animators compose the scenes as it were to fit the music rather than the other way around and then of course there were some final tweaks and stuff they had to do 
afterwards because you know the flow of the movie every so often you're gonna have to make changes and things like that but i thought that was really it was an interesting uh take to go that more traditional route of making the music first and then fitting the animation into it that's really cool and that is i mean opposite from what you'd normally do normally you see the film and you try and fit the music to it and that's what john williams normally does really really well for his other scores is fitting the music to the action Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's it's nice for him, I suppose, to get to just write music and then let everybody else worry about fitting it <laughs> to his music. <laughs> yeah. A few other main themes that I wanted to mention. There's Tintin's own adventure theme. There's a theme for Haddock that starts off as sort of like this drunken theme. But later in the film, as they've trapped Saccharin, it's less drunk, it's more bold. So that theme gets a transformation. You get the silly like clarinet theme for Thompson and Thompson. And the the track Clash of the Cranes is just really, really cool. Like if you want to go listen to any two tracks of this, this score, listen to the very first track, the adventures of Tintin and listen to clash of the cranes. And after you hear how cool those two tracks are, listen to the rest of it. (laughs) (laughs) I never sat down to listen to it until prepping for this. I mean, I obviously listened to it in the movie, but I was, I mean, it's John Williams. So, you know, it's going to be good, but I was surprised at just how good it was. I've said this before, but John Williams' work of the last decade is among my favorite John Williams ever. Like, Lincoln is probably, I've said this before too, and I know some people may call me crazy, but I think Lincoln might be my favorite John Williams score, period. Hmm. I love that music. War Horse was also in this past decade. Lots of great things. Of course, the new Star Wars trilogy, that's not necessarily the best of Star Wars, but There's so much John Williams that is really, really great in this last decade, and Tintin is thankfully among those. I'll have to go back and listen to those others now. I mean, I've heard them in the movie, but just Mm -hmm. listening to them on their own, I'll have to do that. Now, for our final topic, what kind of themes or takeaways or things do you walk away from for this film? I alluded to this earlier, and my kind of overall takeaway from this was the conflict between Saccharin and Haddock. I saw it as almost, they couldn't have meant it back then in in 2011 because it's been a little more recent since this this has been, but I see it as almost a good metaphor for society overall today. It seems like today everyone has to pick sides. You're on one side or you're on another side. And I saw that with Saccharin and Haddock where they had to be on these sides because that was their family. That was just the way it was. And they couldn't see past that. They couldn't just, uh, Saccharin couldn't just, just let it go. Like you said earlier, he didn't need the treasure. He was already rich. He didn't really, I mean, Haddock didn't have anything and he was still just consumed by this vengeance and just wanted to get at him just because, you know, just because it's the way it was. He just let it wholly consume him um, and just eat away instead of just, just letting him go. Imagine what they could have accomplished if they had just set out to work together and Saccharin had used Haddock sort of as a means to an end, but done it as an ally, knowing that only a true Haddock can find the location of the treasure or whatever. So it it is a failure on his part to, I mean, obviously he loses. (laughs) There, there There was no way in which Saccharin won by himself because he had to have a Haddock to do it. And so if he had just worked together, then maybe he would have emerged victorious in some way and perhaps redeemed in the end. But that unfortunately does not happen for him. I wanted to reference the quote from Haddock that I read earlier for my biggest takeaway, which is failure and its control over us. And just reiterating what Haddock says at the end of that, failure only controls us if we let it defeat us. Mm -hmm. I mean, that sort of speaks for itself. And the other thing that sort of stands out to me is curiosity for curiosity's sake the way this film starts you're sort of just you're not dropped in the middle of anything but you're you're with Tintin and he's just walking around the market no look there's a unicorn and oh now somebody wants to buy it and that just starts this chain of events of him asking questions and exploring and just finding history for the sake of finding history and it's not even like trying to solve a case or trying to stop a bad guy at first it's just wanting to learn and then that that aspiration for discovering new things sets him off on this journey, this adventure of Tintin. (laughs) Uh, Sorry about that. (laughs) And so I I really like that Tintin is just this character who wants to know more about the world around him. And that's what initiates everything. 
Yeah. And he's willing to follow the adventure wherever it takes him to, to find those answers. Any final thoughts about the film itself? Uh, I just overall, I, I wasn't sure how well it would hold up. I'll be honest is going back to watch. This was the first time that I'd seen it in a few years. And anytime adventure movies in particular are this way, especially I guess for me, but once I know how, once you see it, you know how it's, how it ends. (laughs) And so the ending is not really a surprise anymore, but I always consider it a mark of a good adventure movie when it doesn't really matter if you know how it ends, you're still sucked in. You're still, you're still brought in by the adventure of it. And I certainly was watching this again, and I'm going to have to make this a, a, a more frequent watch. Yeah, same here. I'll ha- I'll have to check this out more often. I don't know the last time I would have watched this film. It came out in 2011, or basically 2012 is when I would have watched it because I would have gotten it on Blu-ray. And then after that, I've maybe seen it once or twice since before this rewatch. And so it's definitely one of those movies that I'm going to watch more and more just to experience more Spielberg and Williams. And man, I hope for a sequel. You know, yeah. it's been eight years at this point. I. I hope that we get one. Jackson seems to be busy with a lot of other things recently, but as far as I've heard, it is not off the table yet. So here's hoping in the next few years, we'll get a new 1010 film. Yeah, I guess that is one downside to having so many big names attached to it is they're always busy doing something else too. (laughs) Right. They're always seeking the next big thing and not necessarily interested in sequels. Yeah. Although here Spielberg is making Indiana Jones five at the moment, (laughs) but (laughs) but but still that's Indiana Jones. Yeah. yeah, A little bit different. That's true. true. Hey, I'd be happy with a Tintin origin story too. (laughs) Yeah, that'd be fun. Get a a little bit of a precursor. Just do the whole Indiana Jones treatment where you get the the (laughs) grand adventure here and you go back and you learn about how he became who he was and then you go forward and we meet his dad. And uh, and then 30 years later, we get aliens or something Uh, like that. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Well, if that's all we have to say about it, I think that wraps up the 82nd episode of uh, Cinescope. I I swear I almost just said of an American workplace. Oh my gosh. Oh, okay. (laughs) Thank you for joining me, Dan. Yeah, thanks for having me. Contact for the show, facebook.com slash Cinescope Podcast and at Cinescope Pod on Twitter. Please go over to Apple Podcasts, give us a rating and a review, hit that subscribe button so you're notified of future episodes. And if you have any ideas or feedback, please email us, thecinescopepodcast at gmail.com. All those ways are great ways to engage with the show and to help us get boosted in visibility so that other people can find it. What about you, Dan? Where can people find you? Uh, you can find my podcast at based on a true story podcast.com. All my contact information is there as well. Okay. And the best place for me personally is on Twitter at Chadadada. That is C-H-A-D-A-D-A-D-A. Facebook.com slash Chad.Hopkins, where you can see me not post on Facebook. And then there's my other podcast, which I just mentioned, <laughs> An American Workplace, which you can find where podcasts can be found and at workplacepodcast.com. And show notes, contact information for this show can be found at thecinescopepodcast.com. Thank you, Dan, once again, for joining me to talk about the adventures of Tintin. It was great having you back. Yeah, thanks for having me again. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Have fun and celebrate movies. What have you been up to, like movie wise or podcast wise or anything like that? Uh, well, I mean, mostly I've been focusing on the podcast. The last movie that I saw was 1917, which uh, was just fantastic. I, I, I don't know if you've seen it, but just the way that they shot that as mm-hmm. if it was all one take was amazing. Right. I have not seen it yet. My roommate and his fiance actually went and saw it tonight and he said it was great. And you've already told me it was great. And <laughs> I, it's on my list of things to see. I just haven't gotten around to go see, going to see it yet. So it is great. And there's, there's times if you're watching it, you can tell that they use that as a cut. Like the camera will go behind, 
kind of back up a little bit and there'll be a cart that passes in front of it or something. And so you can kind of tell that, okay, that that's going to be a cut, but the continuity in that moment is just, it. they do a really good job overall, just technically. And then the story is, of course, is, is really good too. But um, how about mm-hmm. you? What have you been watching lately? Um, mostly just stuff for the podcast, to be honest. Uh, let's see. I saw Parasite again last week, which was really, really great. I don't know if you've seen Parasite. I have but not. Man, that's a great no, movie. I have not. Um, I went and saw it when it first came out back in like October or November of 2019. And I went by myself because I didn't think my roommate would be interested in it. We're both A-list members at AMC. And so I uh, went by myself and I thought it was great. But it's a subtitled Korean film, so oh. I didn't. That's why I went by myself. <laughs> and so now it's getting all this awards love. And so my roommate was like, you know, I kind of want to see Parasite. And I was like, okay, let's go, <laughs> let's go see it, let's do we'll it. See it again. <laughs> yeah. So we went uh, last week. We we had a day where he took off, and we just sort of hung out, uh, sort of in in celebration of my birthday a little bit. And uh, he we went and saw it, and he loved it. And so that's like, okay, me shaking my hands, rubbing my hands together. (laughs) What can I give you next? (laughs) That kind of thing. By the way, I happen to have this list of 50 movies you need to see. (laughs) (laughs) See, like last year was also the year I went and saw The Farewell in theaters, which was another semi-English, semi-captioned in Chinese film. And I saw that one by myself too. So that was really great. And so knowing that he's open to and can really enjoy movies that are subtitled now, it definitely opens things we can go see in theaters together. Yeah, no, that's that's great. I haven't seen either of those. I mean, I like to watch. I don't have anything against subtitled films, even movies that are in English, the only language that I speak. I'll still watch them with subtitles, but uh, I normally do too. It's more just going to the theater. I just <laughs> that's something that I don't do as often. Yeah, that A list subscription is really really nice because I could see three movies a week if I wanted to, and I if I had the time to. That's the thing, uh, which I usually time. don't, but I'm trying to at least go once. And I mean, that gets me my money's worth. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Nice. I have one thing to say negatively about the soundtrack release, which is like an ultimate sin for me, <laughs> which is in the introducing Bianca Castifiore track. You have the glass breaking at the end of the track, and it is so awful. It is so bad. That. You don't like that it, that they have it at the end, or because? Oh, I I do, I do not. I mean, like obviously in the film, that's the important part of the film where she's singing and she hits the high note, and all of a sudden the glass breaks. Mm-hmm. But to be listening to music in the score album, and all of a sudden you hear the <laughs> the sound of breaking glass, it's so jarring, yeah. and I hate it so much. Yeah, I could I could see that. I have a feeling they probably went back and forth on that one. Like, do we do we leave it in? Do we take it out? What do we do here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, <laughs> I might cut that out because this is a positive podcast, but <laughs> uh, that that's my one complaint about the soundtrack album. Yeah, I can see that. But I think the rest of it makes up for it. Oh, absolutely. 